Do you like JavaScript and music like me? Then this video is for you. Let me show you the real power of vanilla JavaScript and HTML canvas element. In this tutorial, I will cover sounds from complete basics to advanced, and by the end of this video, you will be able to make shapes and colors, react to music, and create beautiful audio visualizers for your creative coding projects. And when you understand the basics, I'll teach you how to make this Melody Maker application, where you click to add notes on a stave and see what melody comes out. So remember to check part 2 linked in the description. You ready? In index.html, I create basic web page markup. I link style CSS file and my JavaScript file. And I create a button element with an ID of button1. I need to give the button some text. Let's just do button1 like this. In style CSS, I will give my body element black background for now. That's it for styling. We will come back here later, but most of this tutorial we will stay in script.js file. First, I want to grab hold of this button element with JavaScript. So I create a constant variable called, for example, button1, and I set it equal to document.getElementById, and I pass it id I gave my button, button1. I take my button1 variable and I call at event listener on it. At event listener takes two arguments what type of event we want to listen for, and a callback function that contains code we want to run every time that event occurs. I will listen for a click event on this button, and every time we click, I will add a console log for now. Let's open browser console to see if it works. Yes, whenever we click the button, we get a new console log. Perfect. What if I want to play a short sound file instead every time I click this button? That's very simple as well. Let me show you how to do it. Up on line 2, I create a new variable called audio1 and I set it equal to new audio like this. New is a special keyword in JavaScript and audio is a built-in class constructor. This is a beginner tutorial, so all we need to understand here is that by calling new audio, we create a new instance of built-in JavaScript audio class, which will create a new blank HTML audio element. This is the same as if we wrote actual HTML audio tag in our index.html file. This audio object can be attached to a web page with JavaScript for user to interact with, or it can just stay off screen and be played. For us to be able to play it, we need to give it some source, which can be any sound file. It will play all the common sound file formats. You can use any audio file you want. For me, I will go to opengameart.org. I use this site for graphics and sounds when building games with JavaScript. Today, I will just grab a random short sound file here, so we can play it for this project. Which one will I pick? I want something short and relatively loud, so we can get nice soundbars out of it. I will use this one. I download it, and I save it in my project folder as spell.wav. Wow. We have our sound file, and now I want to play this file every time I click the button. In script.js on line 6, instead of console log, I will take this audio1 variable from line 2, which holds the new file as its source, and I call built-in play method on it like this. That's it. When I click the button now, the audio plays. I'm not sure if you heard about this before, but you can also add event listeners on audio and video elements for so-called media events. Let me quickly show you what I mean. I take my audio1 variable and I call add event listener event I listen for is called playing. It gets triggered when media starts playing or when it restarts. Whenever playing event on my audio one element occurs, I will run this callback function and inside I will console log for example 
Audio One started playing. There are many other events you can listen for, for example pause, volume change and so on. Let me show you one more. Again, I take audio one variable from line two and add event listener will be for event called ended. Callback function will run when this audio element stops playing and it will just say audio one ended. Let's test it. I click the button and I get audio one started playing and as soon as it ends, I get message that says audio one ended. Perfect. Today we are talking about basics of sounds with JavaScript and we are going all the way to building multiple different audio visualizers by the end of this video. If you watched some of my pixel manipulation tutorials, you know that some browsers don't allow us to analyze image for pixel data for security reasons. Here we face similar problem with sound files. To create audio visualizer from a sound file, we need to analyze it first to get data about timings and frequencies. Because of cross-origin resource sharing security measures, some browsers don't allow us to analyze sound files like this unless they are stored on the same server. You can only analyze files that are stored on the same server. And when it comes to your local projects, some browsers don't consider that to be the same origin. So your analyzer will get blocked by some browsers. I will show you two different ways now how to bypass this issue so we can create fully functional audio visualizers locally on our computer that can play any of our locally stored audio files. One way to do this is to convert our audio file into a base64 string, but unfortunately this string gets very long, even if the sound is just a couple of seconds. So the second way we can do this is to create a file input HTML element. This allows us to select a song from our computer using our browser window. Both of these solutions are quick and easy and they will solve all our problems. Let me show you how. I will Google something like sound to base64 and I will select this link. This can also be done with JavaScript, but what I'm doing now is quicker. Let's keep our focus on audio analyzers today. Here I click choose file and in the pop-up window that opens, I find the audio track I want to convert somewhere on my computer. Only do this conversion for a very short sound files, otherwise you will get a huge string, which is not easy to work with. After this, I will show you a different technique you can use for long songs. So I have my three second long sound file. I called it spell and I just click here on encode audio to base64. You can see even a three second sound file is very long string already, but it is great for our needs so far. Back in script.js, you can see on line two, I created a new variable called audio one and I assigned it to new audio built-in JavaScript class constructor that creates one new blank audio HTML element for me. Then on line three, I'm taking this variable and accessing its source property and setting it equal to path to my sound file. There is even easier way to do this with simplified syntax. I can delete line three completely and instead I can pass that file to my audio class constructor as an argument. JavaScript will understand that this is a source for my new HTML audio element. Instead of passing it path to my file, I will pass it a set of quotes and inside I paste the long base64 string we just generated. This will not work yet because we have to specify type. I will just write it down. It goes like this, data colon audio slash x dash wav semicolon base64. I need to delete this quote here, it's not supposed to be there. And here we go, we are playing a sound file, but we are not using actual file. We are playing this long base64 string that contains all the sound data we need. You can see this base64 string completely replaces the file and it also triggers the same messages in console for media events. We did all of this because soon we will use JavaScript to analyze it so we can attach it to audio visualizer and some browsers, because of security, don't allow us to analyze files in certain circumstances. It is also different browser by browser, so this is a safe way to bypass that issue for every potential scenario. So now we know the very basics of how to play audio files with JavaScript.
We also know how to listen for media events on these files so we can attach our custom code to them if we want to. This video will be mainly focused on playing and analyzing sounds, but I also want you to know that important part of JavaScript Sound Toolkit is a built-in set of properties and methods that allow us to generate sound purely with code. You can also tweak them to sound like different musical instruments, for example. Let me show you first on a very simple basic example, so you understand how generating sounds with JavaScript works. This can be useful even for your games or generative art projects. Also, thank you so much for coding with me today. It always makes me very happy when you say hi in the comments and you let me know that you coded along. Leave a comment and click the like, please, if you're getting any value today. I have button one that plays sound from audio file. I want another button that will play programmatically generated sound. I go to index.html and I create another button element. This time I will give it ID of button2. In script.js on line 14 I create a variable I call button2 and I set it equal to document.getElementById and I pass it ID button2. I take this button2 variable and I call add event listener on it. We will again listen for click event and whenever click event occurs, I will play a custom callback function. I will call it, for example, play sound. This function doesn't exist yet, so here on line 16 I write it. Function play sound and inside let's start by taking audio one variable from line 2 and call play on it, just to test if everything works. Perfect. When I click button 2, the same audio plays as when I click button 1. But we don't want to play the same file. We want to use JavaScript to generate sound with code and we want to play that when we click button 2. How do we do that? It's time to talk about JavaScript Web Audio API. Similar to Canvas context, Audio Web API contains a set of built-in properties and methods that every browser can understand and it serves us as a toolkit to do a lot of sound magic directly in browser. It is actually very similar to how Canvas API methods allow us to create beautiful things by drawing graphics. Web Audio API works on a principle of audio nodes and it can do so many things that I feel are not explored properly anywhere online yet. You can do a lot of creative stuff and sound magic with it. But this is an introduction crash course for beginners, so I will use the simplest examples at first, so you understand the basic concepts properly. Don't worry about the details yet, we need solid foundations first. We will take sound analysis to the next level by the end of this video, but let's spend a little bit more time on the sound generation first. To bring Web Audio API to our project is very simple. In script.js file I create a constant variable called audio ctx, audio context, and I set it equal to new window audio context. or operator window.webkit audio context to make sure it works properly even in Safari browser, which is the last one from all the major browsers that has some limitations with support as of 2021, depending when you watch this video. In most browsers, this line could just be a simple const audio ctx equals to new audio context. I'm using older syntax here to make sure it's compatible with everything, but you won't have to do this forever. The support is getting better. If I console log this audio context variable from line 3, we can actually have a look at it. There are a lot of parts in there. Don't worry about much of it just yet. Let's take it step by step so we understand what's going on. On line 3, I will use modern syntax. You can simplify it like this and it will still work in most browsers. You can see it still works and I see audio context in console because of the console log on line 4. You can look inside to see what's there. There is a lot going on. We will explore some of it today, but don't worry about it too much now. As I said before, I want to play programmatically generated sound when I click button 2. On line 19, I create a new constant variable called oscillator and I set it equal to audio context from line 3 dot create oscillator. This is one of built-in methods of Web Audio API and it creates audio note that generates a tone. I take this oscillator variable and I call connect on it. Connect is another built-in method. 
It can be called on any audio node and you can either connect another audio node to it. I could, for example, connect it to a gain node to control its volume. Or you can connect it directly to destination, which represents a default audio rendering device, so most likely your speakers. Now, I take this oscillator variable from line 19 again and I set its type to, for example, triangle. Type will change the kind of waveform oscillator will output, so basically it will change the sound. I will show you in a minute. This is all we need to create a basic oscillator sound node and play it. I take oscillator and I call start on it. If I press button 2 now, I will get an endless sound, which won't be very pleasant, so let's do one more thing. I will call JavaScript set timeout, which expects two arguments, callback function to run and how long to wait before we run it. I want to wait 1000 milliseconds, one second, and then I will take oscillator from line 19 and I call stop on it. So here I am adding event listener on my button for click event. And when we click, we will run play sound function. Play sound function will first create custom oscillator variable that holds one new audio node. We take that oscillator and connect it to computer speakers. We set its type to triangle. We start the sound, we wait one second and we stop the sound. This is what it sounds like. I can make it shorter by doing just 500 milliseconds here. Or I can make it longer by playing it for two seconds like this. Let's just do a shorter one, 200 milliseconds. Oscillator type can be one of four main things. Sine, which sounds like this. Square, which sounds like this. Sawtooth is this. Let's make it a bit longer, one second, so you can better hear the difference. Sawtooth. Triangle. Square. And sign. So these are the very basics of how we use JavaScript to generate programmatic sounds. These bass sounds can be connected to additional audio nodes that change the sound in many different ways. For the rest of this tutorial, I will focus on sound analysis. We will play our favorite music files and we will learn how to draw interactive animated audio visualizers. If you are interested in learning more about generating sounds with JavaScript, there is a part two to this video. Radu, can you quickly tell us what you cover in that? Sure. Well, yeah, there's this one that we'll build in part two. And in my VVD course, I teach, among other things, how to make a piano app with audio visualizer. And we are now making it work in virtual reality so that you can play it using your hands in front of the camera. Still need to figure some stuff out, but it's probably done by the time this video comes out. So check out the course. It starts off easy, but it becomes really interesting soon enough. And I think you'll like it. You can go and watch it now. I will leave a link in the video description down below. Or you can finish watching this video and then continue to part two if you want. If you're still here, let's build some audio visualizers now. In index.html, I delete both button elements and I create a div with an ID of container. Inside, I create HTML canvas element with an ID of canvas1. We will need it to draw our visualizer graphics. I will also create HTML audio element with an ID of audio1. I will delete its source attribute and I will add keyword controls here like this to make the controls visible on our web page. In style CSS, I delete styles for body element completely. I use asterisk selector to target all elements on the page and I give them margin zero, padding zero and box size in border box to make sure our code looks the same in all different browsers. This will disable browser specific default styles. 
Div with an ID of container will have position absolute, top 0, left 0 and background black. Width 100% and height 100%. Canvas element will also have position absolute, top 0, left 0, width 100%, height 100%. Audio element will have width 50%. That's weird. Oh yeah, my browser is zoomed in. I zoom down to 100%. Margin top will be 50 pixels. Actually, I want to use margin to center it horizontally, so margin top bottom 50 pixels and left right will be auto. This will only work if display is set to block, like this. Yeah, now it's centered. That's it for HTML and CSS. Everything else we will do today will be with JavaScript in script.js file. Let's dig a bit deeper into Web Audio API. Let me show you some really cool things you can do with JavaScript and HTML canvas element. I delete all the code except for these three lines. On line 5, I need to grab hold of the new div with a class of container. So const container is document.getElementById container. And let's set up canvas element. I explained canvas in so many videos. If this is your first video about canvas, all you need to know is that Canvas is a special HTML element that creates a field for us where we can draw interactive animated shapes and images with JavaScript. Canvas size defaults to 150 times 300 pixels, so if I want my canvas to cover browser window, I have to set canvas width to window inner width and canvas height to window inner height, like this. Same as Web Audio API, Canvas works as a set of built-in methods and properties that every browser can understand. It has 2D and WebGL API, which are separate and work in different ways. Today we will use 2D drawing methods to create our visualizers. To get access to these methods, I create a constant variable I call for example ctx, shortcut for context, and I set it equal to canvas.getContext and I pass it 2D. Now I call all built-in canvas drawing methods from this custom ctx variable. I will show you in a minute. I will need another custom variable. I will call it for example audio source. I will just declare it, I won't give it a value yet. And another one I will call analyzer. It will also be empty at first. Let's start with a very simple event. I want the sound to play when we click anywhere on the container element we declared on line 5. Since this element covers the entire page, the sound will play when we click anywhere in the black area. So type of event will be click and callback function that will run will contain some code. At first, I will just take audio one variable from line one and I call play on it. Just to test if everything works so far. Great, it works. My goal now is to play this sound analyze it and generate some shapes on canvas that move based on this sound. How do we do that with JavaScript? Let's take it step by step and explain everything we need to understand to achieve that. It's not that difficult actually. I take audio source variable from line 10 and I call audio context from line 2 dot create media element source built-in method and I pass it audio one variable from line 1. What I'm doing here, I'm basically creating audio source from actual HTML audio element. I'm taking audio one variable from line one and creating an audio node of it to serve as our source. Or to say it much simpler, I'm setting audio one variable from line one as our source. No need to overthink this. <laughs> then I take analyzer variable from line 11 and I set it equal to audio context from line two dot create analyzer. Create analyzer built-in method will create a special analyzer node. This node is used to expose audio time and frequency data. We will need this time and frequency data for our visualizers. So I take audio source node, which contains our audio one sound file, as we declared on line 15, and I am connecting it to analyzer node we created on line 16. Now this analyzer node can do its work and expose timing and frequencies on this file and give it to us as a data object. 
I take analyzer node from line 16 again and I connect it to audio context dot destination, which is our default audio output device, so most likely your computer speakers. Analyzer node has a built-in FFT size property. This is a special property that represents number of audio samples we want in our analyzer data file. Default value is 248, but we can assign it any of these values. 32, 64, 128, 256, and so on. <laughs> Again, this is very simple. We will draw a bar for each set of samples. So if you use a higher number here, you will get more analyzer bars drawn on canvas. Let's set it first to 64 to properly illustrate the effect. I create a constant variable called buffer length and I set it equal to analyzer.frequencybincount. This is a read-only property on analyzer node and it simply contains a number of data values we will have in our analyzer data file. We will draw a bar for each of these, and this number is always exactly half of FFT size property. So when I set FFT size property on line 19 to 64, we will get 32 here. And our audio visualizer will have 32 animated bars. We can go deeper into this, but this is a beginner tutorial, so for now this is all we need to know. I save this bin count in my custom variable I call for example buffer length. All we need to remember here is that buffer length is half of value of FFT size from line 19 and it will represent number of bars in our first audio visualizer effect. I will create another custom variable I call for example data array and I set it equal to new uint8 array and I pass it buffer length from line 20. What's happening here, I need the data my analyzer returns on line 20 to be in a specific format, so I'm creating a custom variable called data array here on line 21, and I'm converting buffer length from line 20 into a special type of array called uint8 array. This type of array can contain only elements that are unassigned 8-bit integers. Again, no need to dig any deeper for now, I'm simply taking buffer length from line 20 and I'm converting it to a format I need and then I am saving that new formatted array in data array variable here on line 21. Now we can finally get ready to draw something nice on canvas. We will start with a very basic bar visualizer effect to make sure we understand exactly what's going on, and then we will play with colors, sizes, shapes and filters to draw something more interesting. I want you to have a solid understanding of what's going on first. I want our bar visualizer to go from left to right, and I want the bars to grow from bottom of canvas towards the top. The first version is basically going to be the usual visualizer you see everywhere. I want each bar to have width that when added next to each other they fill canvas width. I create custom constant variable I call for example bar width and I set it equal to canvas width divided by buffer length. What I did here, this variable is a width of a single bar in our visualizer. And as I said before, buffer length is the amount of details we see about frequencies in our analyze sound file. So each data point in this buffer length will represent one bar in our visualizer. Single bar in our visualizer will have width of canvas width divided by buffer length, which is the number of data samples we have available. Currently, buffer length is 32, because 64 divided by 2 is 32. I will also need bar height. This will need to be a LED variable because it will change its value all the time as our visualizer animates to music. I will also have X variable. This will represent horizontal X coordinate. Each time I draw one bar, I will jump horizontally to the right by the amount of bar width from line 23 so that I can draw bars next to each other horizontally. Now I will animate the bars on canvas. My bars will change height as music plays and as frequencies change. I will create a custom function I call for example animate. This function will contain code that will run over and over creating our animation loop. First I want to clear canvas of old paint from previous frame, so I take ctx variable from line 9 and I call built-in clear rect method on it, clear rectangle. This method simply takes four values to determine what area of canvas we want to clear, and it will delete everything there. I want to clear the entire canvas, so I start at coordinate 0, 0 and I go all the way to canvas width, canvas height. 
Now I need to take analyzer node from line 16 and I call get byte frequency data built in method on it and I pass it formatted data array variable from line 21. Again, no need to overthink this line, we are learning the basics. What's happening here, I am calling get byte frequency data and that method takes data array from line 21 we pass to it as an argument and it copies the current frequency data into that array. Each item in the array now represents decibel value for a specific frequency. Frequency data is composed of integers, whole numbers between 0 and 255. This will determine height of each soundbar in our audio visualizer. I will show you in a minute. And since we are inside animation loop, this data array will be getting updated over and over as the sound plays and the height of our animated bars will be changing based on that. Here I need to put some code that will actually draw the visualizer. It can be bars, circles, falling particles, pulsing images. In a way, you could take any canvas particle effect we built in this series and you can make it move to music, but to do that is a bit more advanced. Let's start with the basics to make sure everything is explained properly first. I will use built-in request animation frame method that simply takes a function name and calls it. If I give it animate, the name of its parent function from line 26, it will create animation loop. To trigger animation, I call animate like this. Now, back to line 30 and let's start with drawing very simple bar visualizer first. I will create a for loop that will cycle through the entire data array. As I said, data array variable from line 21 contains number of elements, audio samples, that correspond to half of value we set on line 19. So right now, we have 32 elements in data array for each timestamp, and each element is an unassigned 8-bit integer. It is a number between 0 and 255, and this number corresponds to decibel value of each frequency. Maybe I'm over-explaining here. All that I'm doing here on line 31, I'm taking bar height variable from line 24, and I'm making it equal to this 8-bit integer in data array, which represents decibel value. Louder sounds will produce longer bars. <laughs> My background is black, so I will make the bars white. Now I use built-in fill rect method, fill rectangle, which takes x, y, width and height and draws a rectangle on canvas. We are inside a for loop that cycles through the entire data array, so this rectangle will be written for each frequency data point in that array. Horizontal x coordinate will be x variable from line 25 because I want the bars to grow from bottom of canvas and go upwards. Vertical y coordinate will be canvas height, which is on the bottom of screen, minus bar height variable from line 31. Width will be bar width, we calculated on line 23, and height will be bar height from line 31. So this is x, y, width and height of my soundbar. This for loop will create 32 soundbars. Some of them might be 0 pixels tall if they don't have many decibels at that point. Each time I draw one bar, I take x variable from line 25 and I increment it by bar width from line 23. This will put the bars next to each other horizontally. When I click, sound plays, but we have no animation. Let me quickly figure out why. Um, I will take audio 1 and audio context variables from lines 1 and 2 and I paste them inside my event listener like this. I also need to delete the console log. Sound plays, but we are not drawing any bars. I will check browser console and I don't see any errors. These two red messages I have in console are just something with favicon. It's some Google Chrome bug, I suppose. It's not related to our project. I comment out line 10. On line 11, I create a constant variable called audio1 again, and I set it equal to document.getElementById, and I pass it id audio1. It's this element on line 13 in index.html. I then set its source to my very long data string. To copy this long line of code, I enable word wrap in my browser. I highlight the beginning of the string. Then I go all the way down, 
and on my Windows PC using VS Code Editor, I hold down left shift key and I left click my mouse to highlight all the code in between. I cut it and I paste it in quotes as source on line 12. Then I disable word wrap again and I delete line 10. This is an alternative way to bring audio file to your project. Hmm, still no sound bars. Okay, I see what's going on. <laughs> X is a variable on line 23 and down here I increase it as my for loop cycles through audio data points. So I am drawing it, but I am pushing my bars endlessly to the right very fast. Here on line 27 I need to make sure that for every animation loop I reset my X back to zero to make the new set of audio bars appear horizontally from left to right again. It should work now. Yes. Congratulations on building your first audio visualizer. For the rest of this video I will focus on Canva's graphics and animations to bring our project to the next level and polish it up. I will show you how to make shapes and colors move to music in different ways and let's see if we come up with something interesting. Click like please if you're ready to join me for the final and my favorite part of this tutorial, creative coding experiments. So we have a very basic working audio visualizer. I built this course as a deep dive into JavaScript audio from basics to advanced. I hope you got a lot of value out of it. On line 31 I can adjust my bar height variable in any way I want. If I multiply it times 2, my bars are now double the original height. I want our visualizer to be able to animate to any sound file regardless of length. I could just convert it to base64 data string and use it as a source here on line 11, but as you can see even 3 seconds of sound are a very long line of code. Imagine what would happen if I did this with a 3 minute song. I could also just put a simple path to my source file directly here on line 11, but in some browsers it will fail when we try to connect this file to Analyzer because of cross-origin resource sharing security measures. That's why we converted our audio source file into this base64 string in the first place. There is another way to load audio file to our project and analyze it without triggering cross-origin resource sharing restrictions. And it's also very simple. I go to index.html and on line 14 I create input element and I give it type file. ID will be file upload for example and accept attribute will be set to audio slash asterisk to make sure this input element takes only sound files. It will give us a button that says choose file and when user clicks it, it will allow them to browse their computer for locally stored audio files. In style CSS I set this file upload input element to position absolute, top 100 pixels, 150 pixels, text color will be white so that we can see this label that currently says no file chosen against our black background. Z index will be set to 100 to make sure this input is always on top of other elements and can be interacted with. In script.js I go up here on line 3 and I want to get a reference to it with JavaScript. New constant variable called for example file is equal to document dot get element by ID and I gave it ID file upload. On line 10 I have event listener for click event on container element. Every time I click anywhere on the container it plays a short sound and shows visualizer bars. I want to do something similar for this file input element. I take file variable from line 3 and I give it event listener for change event. This will trigger every time we use it to select a new file. In this event listener we have access to a list of audio elements that were selected. I can access it with this.files. Files is a property on HTML input element. Let me console log it so you can see. I click choose file. It will also trigger the click event on container so it plays the short sound. It's fine for now. <laughs> New window pops up and in there I can select my local music files. I select one and I open browser console to see what was printed in there because I am console logging this.files. You can see it gives us file list object and first element in there with index 0 is this audio file I selected. I want to save it in a variable so constant files is equal to this.files. 
This file a list object we just inspected in console. I go up to line 11 and I copy this entire line of code const audio1 equals to document.getElementById audio1. I am creating a JavaScript reference to HTML element with an ID of audio1 I created in index.html. This time I will give it this selected local audio file as a source, so audio1 source is equal to url.createObjectURL. I pass it files variable from line 43, and since we console logged it before, we know that my song is the first item in there, so index 0. In programming, we always start counting from 0, not from 1. Create object URL takes whatever we pass to it and it converts it into a string of 16 bit unassigned integers. We are basically doing a very similar thing we did before when we converted the first short audio file to a line of base64 code. So when we select new local file and the change event is triggered, I take the file list object it creates, I create a reference to audio HTML element on my page, and I access its source attribute. Then I take this selected local audio file, I convert it to a line of code, and I set that as my audio source. Then I take audio1 variable from line 44 again, and I call load built-in method on it. The load method is used to update the audio element after changing the source or other settings. Now my file is ready and set up, and I can call play on it. Everything else will be the same as before. We create audio source, we create analyzer, we connect audio source to analyzer node, connect analyzer to destination, which is computer speakers, we set FFT size, buffer length, and we convert it to UINT8 array. Then we calculate width, height, and horizontal X coordinate, and animate all of that with animation loop. I take code between lines 15 and 39, I copy it, and I paste all of that on line 48. We have a lot of code repetition here, we will deal with that a bit later. I just want to show you how this works first. At this point, you can use this choose file button to select any local audio files, and Visualizer will animate and move to your music. So this is how you can analyze and visualize audio files of any length without triggering cross-origin resource sharing restrictions in your browser. For the rest of this video, we will play with code between lines 32 and 35. This code is responsible for what our visualizer actually looks like. Right now, we are just drawing simple white rectangles, but it can look much better. <laughs> We also have identical code here between lines 66 and 69. Let's output this code to a custom function so we can change it only in one place and it will change our visualizers all across the code base. On line 76, I create a custom function I call, for example, draw visualizer. I'm going to use UK spelling. Here we spell it with an S. <laughs> My function will need some bits passed as arguments. I will give it buffer length, x, bar width, bar height, and data array. Then I can take this entire for loop and I can put it inside my reusable draw visualizer function. I could output more code here, but I have reference to analyzer here on line 64 and I would have to deal with passing that around. Let's just keep it simple for now. On line 65, I just take my draw visualizer function and I call it from here like this. Ok, that works. I also take code between lines 31 and 36. I delete it and replace it with my custom function that contains the same code. Now that I have my visualizer drawing code in one place, let's try to do some experiments. How about we dynamically change colors based on frequencies of our music? I create three new constant variables called red, green and blue. And on line 72, in fill style, I will concatenate string RGB plus red from line 69 plus comma in quotes like this plus green from line 70 plus another comma 
plus blue plus close in bracket. Now I can dynamically create any color by assigning different values between 0 and 255 to these three variables. I need to make sure I spell green on line 70 correctly. Any color can be made by combining certain amount of red, green and blue. So far I am just hard coding color values, but what if I make these numbers dynamic? For example, what if I set amount of red to index from line 67 times bar height? Ok, that's a very high number. I can divide bar height by 20. Now we can see that current height of our bars and also their horizontal position affects their color. Amount of green can be i times 4, for example. I'm just playing with random values now. Blue could be, for example, bar height divided by 2. By including i index from the for loop, I am tying color to horizontal position because i increases as the for loop cycles and new bars are added horizontally from left to right. At the same time, we are connecting color to current bar height, so the same bar will have different color when it's short and when it's long. You can play with these to see what you get, have fun experimenting. <laughs> On line 19, I increase FFT size to 128. You can see it gives us more visualizer bars. 256 gives us even more. This is what 512 looks like. 1024, notice that the color composition of our bars changes as well, because we tied colors to index and adding more bars gives us higher index numbers. Our rectangles are starting to look much more like simple lines. I will go back to 128, or maybe 64. So far, we have bars going in one direction, and with most audio files you will have highest bars on the left and a very short bars on the right, because there aren't enough decibels in these high frequencies. What if I wanted my visualizer to be mirrored and symmetrical, where sounds rise from the middle to both sides? It's very easy to do. You can do it in one for loop, or if you want different colors on each half, you can also copy the same for loop again. Now the second set of bars draws behind the right edge of screen as x variable increases through both for loops. On line 52, I set my total bar width to cover only half of my canvas width. I do the same on line 23 so that the effect on click event looks identical. Now you can see what was hidden behind the right edge. We get the bars next to each other like this because X doesn't reset to zero until we run another animation loop here on line 28. Until that point, X just increases on line 74 and 83 through both for loops. I want the first set to be flipped so they start from the middle of canvas. I do that by adjusting horizontal X value on line 73 like this. Yay! It will also work for a music file. On line 19, I change FFT size to 32. On line 72, I set fill style to white. I call fill rectangle and I pass it the same values I pass it on line 75. I push its vertical Y coordinate 30 pixels upwards and I set height of this bar to 20 pixels to make sure there's a small gap. Now we have these small white caps on top of our bars. I do the same thing for the right side. I need to adjust its X coordinate, otherwise I'm just drawing it on top of the other side. Ok, this looks interesting. What if I liquefy it now using CSS filters? I go to style CSS and on line 20 I use CSS filter property. Combination of blur and contrast is used for liquid effect. I try blur 5 and contrast 10. I can tweak these values. Liquid effect doesn't look great on this. <laughs> Maybe if I give it more bars. Let's go to line 19 in script.js and try 2048 bars. 1024? Well, the filter is doing something, but it's not exactly liquid effect. Let's reduce the amount of green on line 70 and on line 81.
In Style CSS Online 20, I disable filter for now. I will also tweak blue and red. Interesting what the colors are doing. Hmm. I reduce the number of bars to 64. In Draw Visualizer, I remove the first for loop. Let me show you how to make Circle Visualizer. Now we are entering slightly more advanced territory and I will play with canvas rotation and maybe trigonometry. Don't feel bad if you don't understand everything. This is course for beginners. Everything I will use are important creative coding techniques, but they might take more than one tutorial to master. Just follow along and I will explain what I'm doing and why am I doing that. I want to rotate canvas every time I draw a bar. On canvas we don't rotate elements, we rotate the entire canvas, draw the element and then we put canvas back as it was. This will result into a rotated drawing. I won't go in details on canvas rotation, I have a deep dive video explaining it properly for beginners. I will link it in the video description. Before we rotate canvas I call built-in save method here on line 69. This will create kind of a save point and when I call restore method later on all the changes between save and restore will be restored back to the original state when save was originally called. This will work for most canvas settings. Before we rotate something on canvas we need to set rotation center point. We do that by using translate method. This method will take x and y coordinate and move it from position 0, 0 to a new position that will be center of our rotation. I want everything to rotate around the center so I set translate to canvas width divided by 2 for x and canvas height divided by 2 for y. Now I can use canvas rotate method that will rotate everything based on the value I pass to it. It doesn't understand degrees, it needs values in radians. I will just put something random in here to see what happens. Okay, this is a mess, but that's because I never restored canvas. So here I save my current canvas settings. I translate coordinates 0, 0 to the middle of the canvas, making that rotation center point. I rotate canvas by some value. This is most likely wrong. I will get back to this in a second. Now I rotated my canvas. I will actually draw my shapes. And then I call restore, which will look at this save method and it will restore all canvas settings to that point, removing all canvas translates and rotates that happened in between. One thing you need to understand is that when I translate canvas position 0, 0, which normally sits in the top left corner, when I translate it to different coordinates, so in this case middle of my canvas, horizontally and vertically, Shapes drawn after that translation will see that point as 0, 0, so everything is being pushed further right and down by that value. On line 76 I set x and y to 0, 0, which will place it in the middle of the screen, because that's my new location 0, 0, as I translated it here on line 70. I do the same on line 78. Now you can see that center of canvas is being treated as location 0, 0 and as canvas rotates by some multiplier of i index variable from outer for loop, even though my bars grow from the bottom to top, they actually grow in a circle now because I save canvas, I rotate it, then I draw that bar and then I restore my canvas back. Don't worry if this feels like a bit too much to wrap your head around. Canvas rotation is notoriously difficult and it takes a couple of projects and experiments to understand it properly. This is a beginner level tutorial. You are doing great if you are still coding along. Don't feel you need to understand everything on the first try. It took all of us some time to learn this. You can make the bars shorter on line 68. Look what happens if I replace plus sign with multiply here on line 71. That looks nice. The middle white area is these two lines of code right here. Let's remove them. I will also remove red, green and blue variables. You already know how to attach colors to horizontal position and bar height. I want to create a spiral visualizer, so now I will tie colors to index, but in a different way. I will use HSL color declaration, hue, saturation, lightness. All we need to know is that hue, the first value, is an angle on HSL color wheel. 
So as the hue value increases, we cycle through the entire color spectrum. I create a constant variable I call for example hue and I set it to 40. On line 73 I create HSL color declaration again and I concatenate string here, same as we did with RGB. But this time I can only use one variable for hue and I can still get the entire spectrum of all colors. Right now hue is 40, which is somewhere between red and green. I'm missing a bracket here. Instead of this hardcoded value of 40, I set hue to index. All I need to know about hue in HSL color declaration is that 0 is red, 120 degrees is green and 240 is blue. Then 360 is red again and you can keep increasing. It will keep cycling around the color circle. All the values in between are different combinations of these colors. I times 15 cycles through the entire color spectrum and starts from red again. This is how you build a very simple circle visualizer and how you tie colors to indexes. There is much more we can do with it. Let's start by increasing number of bars. On line 19 I set FFT size to 512 and also on line 48. On line 68 I make the bars bigger. I have a lot of indexes in my array so hue cycles too fast. I adjust it on line 72. Let's try 256 on line 48 and on line 19. Ok, I will do 128. Look what happens if I mess with math.py on line 71. I can make it wrap in on itself. Now we are getting a spiral. I adjust U on line 72 so we can better see what I just did. I think this looks really cool. Bars are basically doing a second circle around and it creates a really interesting visualization. It also depends on what music you play. Some audio files can stretch our visualizer more than others. On line 23 I set bar width to 5 pixels. How about 15 pixels? This one looks great. Coding experiments. <laughs> you never know what you discover. I also set bar width to 15 on line 52. We are creating a spiral of colors as differently colored bars lay on top of each other. Again on line 71, look how much it changes the effect if I swap operator to plus. This looks interesting in a different way. There is still symmetry to it, especially if I adjust hue on line 72, you should be able to see the branches. I will play with hue. And now I will try to apply liquid filter again to see what we get. Let's uncomment line 20 in style CSS for a while. We need more bars in our effect. On line 48 I try 512, also on line 19. Now hue is too much, so I adjust it on line 72. Yeah, this is what I was going for. What if I add more blur and more contrast? Even more contrast? I think we need to give canvas black background color to make the edges look liquid as well, they still look blurry. When you come up with something nice in your experiments, I want you to use your visualizer to play your favorite music and listen to it on maximum volume. I hope you are having fun exploring JavaScript with me and you are getting a ton of value and inspiration today. Please let me know what you think. If people like it, I can make more projects like this. It's hard for me to know what will resonate with people without getting feedback, so every one of your comments counts. 
I disable filter on line 20 in style CSS. It looks interesting even without the filter, doesn't it? Line 71 is what changes the final shape of our visualizer. Math.py multiplied by something determines how far along the circle we rotate our bars. The higher number I use here, the more it will spiral in on itself. This is a pretty nice spiral. I can try to blur it. If you want some static circle in the middle, you can add it here to bar height on line 68. High frequencies rarely get triggered, so it might be better to spiral it up a bit more so we don't get area that doesn't move like this. Even though it also looks quite unique, some people might like this. I can also go wild on the spiral. Let's do math.py times 10. Some songs won't really trigger it all the way to dark blue. I like to play with these things. I spend a lot of time experimenting like this for fun off camera. Today I'm just showing you a bit behind the scenes. I'm not sure if someone actually wants to see my process or you prefer me to give you final values and you don't care how I got there. <laughs> It looks like I can reload my CSS and apply filter without restarting my song. Interesting. This is extreme blur. <laughs> Sometimes subtle changes in hue color could be better just to show off layers without actually having to circle through all the colors. I guess visuals like this are quite subjective anyway. On line 73, I tied hue to index to position of this particular bar in the array. HSL color declaration is value for hue, saturation and lightness. I can also replace any of these values with a variable and make them dynamic. Let me show you how to do it with lightness. We usually keep it on 50%, which is color, not affected by light or dark. Lightness close to zero is black and close to 100 is white. Let's try and tie lightness to bar height. Short bars should be dark, Long bars should be light and middle size bars should be full color. That's too much. I try bar height divided by 2, divided by 3. This is the effect I used in intro and I love it. We can also take what we learned today and apply it to a particle system. I built all different kinds of particle systems here on the channel. If you like this video, please let me know in a comment and I can show you how to replace this draw visualizer custom function from line 66 with a full-on particle system. Then we can literally take any of my canvas animation videos, even pixel manipulation effects on images, and we can make them dance to music. We can also separate high and low frequencies and make different effects for different instruments. We have just scratched the surface of sound magic you can achieve with Web Audio API. If you are a beginner and you code it all alone, you are doing a great job. Thank you so much for letting me be part of your self-taught coding journey. My goal is to inspire you to continue learning and to help you as much as I can. I hope this helped you to understand how sound analysis works and I'm looking forward to see some of your creative audio visualizers. If you coded with me today, let me know in the comments. You can just say something like, I finished the project. There is a part two to this tutorial with Radu. Link in the video description. Check it out. I will see you soon.